Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living. We are studying the first epistle of Peter. Now previously we looked at verses 7 through 8 of chapter 4, and so today we're picking up at verse 9 here. So let's just dive right in. And so at verse 9, we read the following. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So Peter was just saying in the prior verses that we reviewed that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful. Remember that? Be serious and watchful in your prayers. And so this is the context that we are seeing these following verses, such as what we're reading in verse 9 and forward. Meaning, here are things that we should do while we are being serious and watchful. Because we are living on a very limited amount of time. The time remaining is very little. And therefore, we should be thinking with that mindset. You see, Peter already gave one example saying that we should spend this little time remaining having fervent love for one another, which, as we discussed in the prior one, had much to do with not sinning against God or against one another or our neighbors, right? That's right. Instead, we should use that time to, out of love, save them, right? To save them out of love and to pull them away from sin and toward God, right? And All that, which we discussed, right? But Peter, he adds here that we should be hospitable toward one another without grumbling. You see, God, by the way, knows grumbling very well, doesn't he? And we surely know examples from the Old Testament where the people of Israel grumbled against God and grumbled against Moses in the wilderness after escaping Egypt, right? Yeah, and things didn't exactly go well with them for their grumbling, did it? You recall. Now, all those things happened, right? And they were written for us so that we would benefit from reading it and so that we might learn how to be gracious and patient, right? Without grumbling. And as Peter says here, to be hospitable to one another, right? Even today, right? And of course, this verse is not separate from verse 8 before it, which describes our having fervent love for one another. But there's more to say about this. If we also remember the context of which the people at that time had suffered during their life, remember, as we noted all along so far, that Peter writes to them in this epistle to encourage them through the suffering and persecution that they have experienced or might likely endure very soon. And so, listen to me carefully here. For believers back then, hospitality toward one another was very important because if they didn't have each other, they would feel totally isolated and discouraged, right? Even their their very own soul would be discouraged. You know, Christians who were being sought out and even hunted down to be discriminated against and imprisoned and abused and tortured, well, you can imagine that at some point, having access to food and access to friendship and access to fellowship in the Word of God required that they endure together, bearing with one another through their hardships. I mean, give it a thought for one second, because I think we take this for granted sometimes. Regardless of having different personalities, they and we are called to bear with one another and pursue being hospitable toward one another in order not to discourage one another's soul, right? In times of hardship, in times of tribulation, in times of uh, just suffering and persecution, People need one another, right? Particularly, believers will need one another. 
You know, they need to build one another up to encourage one another, to lift, to lift up one another so that they don't get overly discouraged and fall away from the faith in the face of persecution. And you know what? We do take this for granted today because today we have all the food we need and nobody has made it difficult for us to find a way to eat. We feel self-sufficient and as though we don't need anyone else, right? We feel self-sufficient as if we don't need one another. Today, we have shelter and we are able to provide for ourselves, right? Because nobody has been chasing us down, seeking our life. So we often feel like we don't need one another because in this way, we feel self-sufficient also, huh? You know, it's bad enough that we often feel self-sufficient apart from God. But even feeling self-sufficient apart from one another is a dangerous thing. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people around the world today who are running from the enemy because of their faith. Surely, there are many people who are being persecuted today, and they are trying to find food and shelter and safety. But speaking generally, much of the developed world isn't facing the same widespread persecution that they faced back then in areas where churches were growing. You see, when we put this into context, we see this verse a little bit differently, don't we? You know, something we discuss often is that times are about to change. And the Christian world today, who has had many years of freedom, throughout developed areas in the world, will soon find that the world has turned against them. You see, persecution will rise again. Listen, we're not guessing here, okay, or speculating. It will happen. You see, it is written in the Bible. And while many people might respond by saying, oh, well, you know, Christians have always been persecuted. That's nothing new. Well, my friends, you overlook that the Lord said that those days which are coming, okay, there will be great tribulation like was never before in the history of the world. And you overlook the multitudes and multitudes of people who will be, de- who will be beheaded during the great tribulation that is coming. And a very specific period of time in the last days, which the Lord himself has confirmed, will in fact come to pass. Look at your life now. And remember this discussion that we're having now because things will change very soon. And in those days, okay, in those days, you will know for sure the importance of being hospitable to one another. The importance of showing love to one another. Encouraging one another's souls in the face of a very difficult time. You see, Peter's letter here, just like the rest of the Bible, will suddenly seem to make so much more sense to many people, although it's always made sense and has always been important, right, for all of us as advice, practical advice for us today, but we just overlook it because we often feel this false sense of security and this false sense of self-sufficiency today, right? And by the way, why do we describe it as a false sense of security and sufficiency? Well, because it's when we begin to feel and think as though everything that we have and do come from our own hands. You see, it's then at that point where we begin to forget that God is the source of our sufficiency. See, and it's in that context that we are more likely to follow our own will and our own desires rather than the leading of the Holy Spirit. And When we live like that, we tend to neglect our duty to be hospitable to one another and even to the stranger. But if we know that God is the source of our sufficiency, meaning that God will provide for us both during good times and during difficult times, then at all times we would gladly receive all that the Lord provides for us and in turn we would provide to those around us, that is, we would provide to one another and to the stranger. For example, when we know that the Lord is the source of our comfort, then 
we joyfully receive that comfort, and then we also seek to comfort one another with the same comfort with which he comforts us. You see, stop to think about that. Actually, that's a verse that we'll look at in just a moment here. And, of course, this is something that we should experience today and now. You see, even when times are good, even when we don't feel oppressed or persecuted. However, it does tend to be the case that we overlook it during those good times. And so it's often in times of difficulty that we do recognize the importance of loving one another and being hospitable to one another. You know what it reminds me of? It's not too different from how when times were good long ago for Israel throughout the Old Testament, during those good times, they would eventually stray away from the word of God, you know, and they would end up in big trouble. Even they would end up as captives in a foreign land. And it was during that chastening, you see, it was in that time of captivity, during times of trouble, that the people turn back to God and begin also to deal kindly with one another, with the widow and with the fatherless and the stranger, right? Just as God himself had commanded. And it is unfortunate that we often don't really appreciate its importance until those bad times come upon us. However, when we keep our minds in the scriptures regularly, then we are able to stay grounded in the word of God. And we would remember the importance of loving one another and being hospitable to one another and to the fatherless and to the widow and to the stranger, right? You know what else is so interesting regarding loving one another and being hospitable to one another? You know, look at the epistle uh, to the Hebrews in chapter 13. Just look look at this very quickly. This is really interesting. The uh, epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 2. Look at this. He says here, Okay. Let brotherly love continue. And in verse, thir- in verse 2, he says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Again, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And I believe it is just as it is written here. You never know how or at what time the Lord God might test your heart and might test your love and might test your hospitality toward one another, even the stranger, by your encountering even an angel or even the Lord himself in a way or form that you do not recognize. Think about that one. In this case here, It's about kindness and hospitality, even to the stranger. Now, by the way, look at verse 3 that follows here. Look at verse 3 that follows it. It says here, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, as in persecution or uh, going through trials, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. You see that? We are as one body with them. Remember all all the things that we discussed before regarding all the believers being different members of one body, right? Of the same one body. And we won't go over all that again now, but just, uh, just know and see how all of this is foundational and comprehensive and important to the believer in Jesus Christ and the gospel. We see here a very clear context of suffering and persecution. And it is especially under that circumstance that we tend to open our eyes and see more clearly the importance of this thing called love. And I know that in the days ahead, the people of God who love Jesus Christ and love the gospel will unite in love, even giving up their own lives to encourage one another in the faith. You know, it's coming, friends. It's coming, and it's a very real thing. 
Don't take this for granted, but think upon it and remember it. And you know, think about kindness and hospitality toward the stranger. And this reminds us, by the way, of how the Lord God instructed the Israelites not to be harsh or mistreat the stranger. Do you remember that? And we can look at examples. Oh, we could sure look at examples. The Lord brought this up a number of times. The Lord wants us to honor even the stranger. Look at, let's just take a peek at that. Very. This is very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Look, Exodus chapter 22, verse 21. What did the Lord God say here? Look, you shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. See, we sh- he's saying don't, don't be hypocrites. Don't forget that you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Therefore, when you see a stranger, you should not mistreat them or oppress them. Right? Wonderful, wonderful point. Look, let's go to Exodus uh, chapter 23. And let's look at verse 9. The Lord God says to them, Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Yeah. See that being emphasized again. Oh, boy. Let's look at Leviticus. Let's look at the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. And let's look at verse 34. What we read here. Oh, look at this. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. See that? The stranger who dwells among you, you shall, uh, the stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers. In the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. You see how God is so fair, so righteous, and reminds them that, hey, listen, even the strangers who are dwelling around you, don't forget that you were strangers yourself. Therefore, you should honor the stranger who's around you, right? And you shall, you shall love him as yourself. Oh boy, why don't we just take a look at maybe one more. Let's look, the book of Deuteronomy. Right? We're seeing this throughout the whole Old Testament. Let's look the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. Let's look at verse 19. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I think God made his point to them, didn't he? And you know what, by the way, the apo- that's the Old Testament. But did you know the Apostle Paul reminds them of this very thing? In the New Testament, and that's many, many years later, my friends, after Jesus came and after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus back to heaven, saying to them in the book of Acts, this is where where, uh, he says to them in the book of Acts, let's go here, Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 13, uh, verse 16, and verse 17. Let's take a look. Look at this. Then Paul, the apostle Paul, then Paul stood up. And motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. See that? He reminds them. That they themselves were strangers. They dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And by the way, the Paul, the Apostle Paul uh, brings this up because the Apostle Paul is going to a people who were considered as strangers to the land of Israel. Who? He's going to the Gentiles. So in preaching to the Gentiles, the Gentiles to Israel are considered like strangers to them, right? And it is a reminder here to them that they themselves, hey, Israel, don't forget what God told us in the Old Testament. Don't forget. Don't forget. You yourselves, remember, were strangers in the land of Egypt, you see? And so, my friends, it's not just in the Old Testament. It is a reminder in the New Testament. And it is a reminder for us, the church, the body of Christ today, that we are 
to entertain the stranger, right? By by showing them the same love and treating them in the same way that we ourselves would want to be treated, right? And so it's pretty clear then, okay? It's pretty clear then. If Peter, in the epistle, by the way, that we're studying now, has reminded us, as we have seen, that we, remember, he reminded us, and, and we discussed about, we discussed this earlier on in his epistle, where he reminded us that we are only pilgrims and sojourners passing through this world, then we too are like a stranger, right? That makes us like strangers in this world, in, in a way. And so we too should not oppress those whom we perceive as the stranger to us. You see how all that makes sense? It's very important. But even now, we can take note of the various times the Lord throughout the gospel gave examples, by the way, of how when we do something kind toward one another, it is as if we do it to him. Listen again. The Lord Jesus gave us examples in the Old Testament that when we do something kind toward one another, it is as if we're doing that kind thing to him. You see? And if we keep ourselves from doing something kind to others, right? If we keep ourselves from doing it to others, then it is as if we're keeping ourselves from doing that kind thing to him. And we can, by the way, take, let's just take a peek at one of those examples. We can look at the gospel according to Matthew. Take a peek here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 45. Let's just take a look at that. The Lord Jesus says here to them, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And what else? He says, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then, listen to this. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now pay attention. Listen Listen what the Lord says to them. They, he, what he's saying to them, who he says, Come, come, you are blessed of my Father. Come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does he say to them? He says this. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. See? Then the righteous, those whom he's speaking to, he says, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you drink? When? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You see that? Because you did it to them, it is as if you did it to me. That's what the Lord Jesus is saying. But look at this. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. You see that? And then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? There's that stranger, right? Or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you, meaning serve you. Then... He will answer them, 
saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So that point is very clear. It is, it is basically the Lord's expectation under every circumstance, right? So, I would say, however, that we should be very clear about something. We should be very clear about something. Although God has taught his people back then, okay, let's just pull up our passage here. There we go. Although, okay, although God has taught his people back then, and he continues to teach us today to show kindness and hospitality to one another, and also to the stranger, do not confuse this concept as if we are to accommodate the sins and the abominations of the people around us. No, no, no. There's not the same things, right? God has always condemned the idol worship, right? And all the other evil things that those nations and people around them took part in. God said, do not take part in any of those things. See, God gave plenty of warning about that, didn't he? And God said, okay, God today, by the way, is the same God, right? And he does not accommodate the wicked abominations of the people. And today, we are still not to accommodate these things, right? So we should not confuse this concept of having and showing love and hospitality as if that somehow suggests that we should be expressing our love to others by accommodating those wicked things. Absolutely not. Just a very basic concept throughout the Bible. Okay, We love them by praying for them that they may repent of their sins and turn to the gospel and believe, but we do not participate or accommodate any of these abominations. God has sanctified us, friends, and he has set us apart as holy for him. That means to be his own special people, right? Just as we've been studying all along. Now, that was verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Let's read verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, as we have noted quite a few times already, believers in Jesus Christ who are sanctified by having received the Holy Spirit with faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and having walked away from their sins, walking instead in the Spirit, no longer of the flesh. See, all those who are sanctified in this way, are as different members of the same one body, right? Okay, we are members of the same body, the body of Christ. And each member has a different function, right? That's right. And we should remember these things because we spoke about these in detail already and looked at the passages associated with them. And as each member has a different function, it is by the empowering of the Holy Spirit who gives each member a kind of gift such that they, as a member of the body of Christ, are able to serve one another in one way or another, right? We are able to serve one another in one way or another. And so Peter says here, okay, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another. Now, what does it mean that we minister it to one another? Well, the Greek word that was translated minister here also has the meaning of serving, right? It's also where the title deacon comes from, right? Because the job of the deacon had much to do with serving the people, right? And so it has the meaning of ministering, right? Ministering. And so when Peter says that we are to minister it to one another, 
He is suggesting that we are to serve one another with the spiritual gift that we are given by the Spirit of God. And look, Peter, by the way, confirms this by continuing to say, as good stewards, right? Look at this. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards. See, there it is, as good stewards. So you see, we are to minister these gifts to one another as good stewards. And as you know, a steward throughout the Bible is one who is given the responsibility to care for the things of God, meaning in this way, we serve God by caring for the things of God until our Lord Jesus returns for us. Now, we can understand that God gives us these spiritual gifts because he expects us to be good stewards. You see, his own good stewards, right? Stewards of God who take care of the things of God. Now, in a world where the people of God suffer, God has given us these gifts, as we noted, in order that we encourage one another and comfort one another in the face of persecutions and troubles. See, we can never forget that the Lord Jesus told us beforehand that if we follow him, we are no longer of the world, right? And because we are no longer of the world, then the world will hate us, just as we read in the gospel. And so, to different degrees, the people of God will suffer some persecution in the world. And if, you know, if we have not yet experienced such a thing, believe me, a time will surely come when we will. And we have to understand that the spiritual gifts that the Lord gives to us, his servants, that is, we, his servants, okay, is meant to provide exhortation and edification and comfort to one another. Because God himself empowers us to encourage each other by means of these spiritual gifts, right? The Apostle Paul says in uh, the second epistle of Corinthians, let's just take a quick look at that. The second epistle uh, to the Corinthians in chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, he says this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Who comforts us? God, the God of comfort, right? Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you catch that? Let's read that again. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you understand that? You see, God comforts us in our own personal troubles, okay, our own personal troubles and our own hardships. And he does this so that we may also be able to help others who are also going through any of their own troubles and their own hardships. You see, with the same comfort God gives to us, we also are to comfort others. You see, that is because we are, as we said, different members of the same body, the body of Christ. The writings of the apostles are always complementing each other, right? They always complement one another in that they are always emphasizing and highlighting all the same exact important things. And, you know, we just keep seeing this as we study the Bible, don't we? We keep seeing these uh, parallels, these uh, that align between the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul and even uh, throughout the, all the epistles, right? And so, let's go back to our passage here. And so, as good stewards, 
And so Peter continues further by saying that we minister these gifts as good stewards, okay, of the manifold grace of God. You know, okay, that's important to note there, okay? As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards, like servants of God, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And he adds this point here because it's important to be reminded that it is by the grace of God, okay? It is by the grace of God that those who are sanctified by the Holy Spirit are set apart as his servants, okay? And it is by the grace of God that they are given a kind of spiritual gift with which we can serve one another. All of this is, uh, has much to do with the grace of God. You see, it has everything to do, actually, with the grace of God. Because remember uh, what we said before about grace and mercy. See, God's grace is when we receive something that we don't deserve. And this would be a gift, right? Because we receive something we don't deserve, and so that would be a gift. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up to suffer and die for us, though we did not do anything to deserve it. Therefore, it was the gift of God to us, demonstrating his grace toward us. See, a gift. Mercy, however, okay, but mercy is the withholding of a punishment that we deserve. Meaning, we deserve to be punished, but instead, God withholds his punishment. And so we are not punished. You see, this is because of God's mercy. Now, in that case, we can also say that because of God's grace, we receive God's mercy, right? We can say that because since God showed us grace by giving himself up for us as a gift, then those of us who believe in the gospel of grace, because we believe in it, we then receive mercy and are no longer under the wrath of God, but are now saved and are as the children of God. See that? So, as we think of God's gifts, we are to remember also that God, through His grace, has given us gifts. That's all what we're discussing here today, isn't it? God, through His grace, has given us gifts, okay? And we are to serve one another as good stewards, okay, or good servants, by using these gifts to each other's benefit, to edify and to lift one another up in the things of God. And just as we have seen the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul's teachings being very consistent, we can look to the Apostle Paul's discussion about these gifts in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Let's just take a quick peek at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and let's just uh, start at the beginning here. Let's just read a little bit. We'll just look at it just a little bit here, okay? It's, it's titled here, Spiritual Gifts Unity in Diversity. Let's just read this here. He says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Okay? He says, You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, 
to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. And if you continue to read on below, by the way, you will see that it's not a coincidence then that the Apostle Paul transitions to his discussion about our being different members of the same body. The very passage that we studied previously and were reminded of several times, right? Because this has everything to do with what the Apostle Peter is saying in our passage today. Okay, make sure to pause here and see just how consistent it is and how true it is, right? Now, also, you know, go ahead and pause here and read further in this chapter, okay, in verses 12 and on, if you need to refresh on that very principle uh, once again. Now, back to our passage here. We're going to now read uh, verse 11, but let's just refresh on verse 10 that we just studied. As each one, okay, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability with which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, Peter gives us an example here, okay, in the form of an instruction, saying that if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Okay? And that means, okay, that means if anyone stands to teach, okay, or if anyone stands to preach, that they should take care to teach or preach the things of God. See that? And we can understand this very simply as the preaching and teaching of the scriptures of the Holy Bible. You see, not deviating from them. Peter says, let him speak the oracles of God. And by this, Peter is suggesting that the things that are spoken should be the divine mysteries, okay, and the divine revelations of God and the divine scriptures of God. They should be the things that are scriptural, meaning they are inspired by, consistent with, and from the Holy Scriptures, that is the Bible, and that they are things that are led by the Holy Spirit. Again, they are things that are led by the Holy Spirit. Now compare these things that are scriptural from the Bible and led by the Holy Spirit, compare that with the things that are not scriptural, okay, and are led instead by the flesh rather than the Spirit. You see, the first is derived from the Word of God and is through the Holy Spirit of God, while the other is derived from another place, see, from the desires of men and not God, and are led instead by the flesh. That means they are led by the carnal mind, the mind of man that seeks things that are not led by the Spirit of God. You see, that should bring to mind what the Apostle Paul says about the flesh and the Spirit warring against one another. And so regarding these spiritual gifts by which we are to serve each other, Peter also says here that if we do, then we should do it as with the ability which God supplies. Look, if, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability with which God supplies. 
Let him do it with the ability which God supplies. What does that mean? Well, okay, what that means is that if God gives us a spiritual gift, then he also supplies us with the ability to minister it, to serve others with it, right? Now, the Greek word that is translated here as ability okay, also has the meaning of power and might and strength. And so we understand this verse then to suggest that it is not by our own power or by our own strength or our own ability that we minister these gifts to one another, but rather it is by God's power and God's might and God's strength that we are able to minister it, right? That, my friends, is where this ability for us to serve one another with these gifts comes from, okay? And does Peter confirm this to us? Yes, he sure does, because Peter follows it up by saying that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, Peter is saying, make no mistake about it, these gifts that we receive to serve and comfort and edify and exhort one another is meant to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, because it is to Him whom all the glory and all the dominion belong. And as you can expect, the Apostle Paul did comment on this also in uh, the second epistle to the Corinthians, okay, in chapter 3 and verses 4 through 6. Let's just take a quick peek there. Look, he says this. He says this here. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. You see, he says here, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. You see that? To think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. You see that? And he clarifies it by saying, but our sufficiency is from God. Just as Peter emphasized, okay, that our spiritual gifts and our ability to minister those spiritual gifts are not of ourselves, but are from God. You see, it is the same, right? Now, let's just understand how practical this is, okay? By tying this whole discussion uh, all together, okay? Peter, the Apostle Peter, says that the end of all things is at hand, didn't he? But the end of all things is at hand, all right? And so we should have love and hospitality toward one another, okay? And this is especially in the context of the body of Christ enduring through persecution together because the end of all things is at hand, okay? You will see that Peter continues, by the way, in the coming verses, all right, that Peter will continue to elaborate on this very thing, right? He will, talking about this suffering for God's glory. You see? He'll continue to elaborate on this. And he is saying that despite the hardships and persecution that is in the world, the Lord our God provides his servants, that is you and I, if we believe and repent and abide by what is written in the Holy Bible, we are his servants. Okay, that through hardships and persecutions, he provides us with these spiritual gifts that we may serve one another. Why? In order to edify and lift one another up, encouraging each other 
and comforting one another in the face of discouragement. Because that, okay, is something we should take care to know and to understand, right? That these gifts are not of ourselves, but they come from God, and we are empowered with these gifts through His Holy Spirit. And therefore, we should be sure that all the glory, not a little bit, look, all the glory, okay, that all the glory and all the credit is always directed to the Lord and not to ourselves. It is the grace of God, friends, the gift of God that He gave us, right, that should warm our hearts to know Him, to love Him, to thank Him, and to give Him all the glory that He deserves. Well, friends, until the next one, I'm wishing you a very, very blessed weekend.